And I told you microcephaly, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, keep in mind. Uh, last page, next page, something like that. We're almost done here. And the lock zone or not a pen. I wanted you to put, um, I didn't have a page, so I just said, fuck it, put autism on this one because they have a lot of space. Autism spectrum disorders, and you're going to put ADHD at the top. They're very similar. Autism spectrum disorders. Make sure you say it includes this, Asperger's. Now, autism spectrum disorder is um, obviously going to be uh, early signs as early as two months of age. They do not smile. So about eight to 10 weeks, you notice you can't make them smile. Another symptom, no eye contact, no response to their name. Okay, so no response to their name. They do not want affection. They're hypersensitivity, hypersensitive to touch, colors, smells. Mostly boys. Something genetic is going on because twins have it, triplets have it. So something genetic is going on as well as environmental. One in 55 children have it, mostly boys. This patient usually has seizures. This patient usually has seizures. They can be banging, rocking, swaying, repetitive motion. They have quite a few obsessions. So they may collect paper clips, collect scrunchies. They may collect backs of your earrings. They have obsessions and collections. Obsessions and collections. They cannot deal with too much stimulation. The number one therapy is routine. The number one therapy for them is to keep everything in a routine. Medications used with this child are often antipsychotics, like Seroquel or Abilify. I used to say A for Abilify, A for autism. Autism has been called juvenile schizophrenia. Juvenile schizophrenia. Diagnosis is usually done by age three. The other type of autism that exists is that the child was perfectly functioning fine, and all of a sudden, out the blue, about maybe 12 months, 15 months, 18 months, 24 months and some, so somewhere in there, 12, 15, 18, or 24 months, all progression stops, all language stops, all socialization stops. So there are two types. Ashburgers does not have much of what we just said, except for the collections and obsessions. They communicate better than most, but they do it in a monotone. So unfortunately, or fortunately, I'm not sure which one, because it's sad that sometimes we never know which is what it is. But both of these children are geniuses but sometimes we never discover how. But both of them are actually geniuses. Incredibly intelligent in some way, right? The Asperger's child usually makes it known what he's good at. Now, the Asperger's go to school with regular kids a lot of times, autism may or may not, but the Asperger's child, you probably have sat by him, had in your class, I have a son with it, um, a million times. So. He's doing, out of all my kids, the best in college, and he graduated and has a teaching job. So go fucking figure. So he surpassed all the brats. So he graduated from Kent State, and he substitutes at Brush High School. He teaches junior high. I mean, it's fine. But 
He's socially awkward. That's what you got to remember on your test. He's socially awkward. So I remember him buying books on how to date a girl. I remember him saying to dad, I'm going to the mall to find a girlfriend. We're like, no, not so much, buddy. Uh, I remember when we first met him, the very first day, he didn't know we were at the house yet. And we were all getting together for a movie. And he's in the back room. Hey, dad, isn't it fun to look at your dick in the mirror? <laughs> We laugh about that at least every Thanksgiving. We always tell the stories. So he's fine, absolutely fine, just adorable, but socially sometimes a little awkward, right? Okay, other than that, he's doing good. Okay, child abuse and partner violence. Oh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Listen, this one is almost like Asperger's, but they're not necessarily socially inadequate or awkward. They just really are geniuses as well. Most of them are very bright, but they don't appear to be because they keep getting in trouble in school initially. So they may be very bright, but you don't know that because all you hear is complaints. So what are they doing? They're interrupting you while you're talking. They can't stop talking themselves. They don't know how to take turns. They really don't know how to take turns. They are impatient. They, um, I used to think it was just failure to discipline. No, this is a problem. They actually have a real problem. They can't pay attention at all. If they tried, they couldn't. They can't sit still. Uh, we have one of these babies too, and the best therapy we could ever have come up with, and I don't know where I read it, was 20 minutes of homework, 20 minutes of play. Worked out really well. We didn't do medication, but then we didn't have to. Some people do have to, and it really improves their child so much in school. It's a last resort, though. Make sure you know that. Medications are a last resort. Because they make you lose weight. It's hard to keep their weight up. They're tachycardic. The medications make them a little bit irritable in terms of, um, uh, it's like a zombie. It takes their personality away. They're like a zombie. And it is fine if it's the last resort, but try everything, everything before you go there. And you may have to go there because it will make an incredibly uh, difference, incredibly big difference in their school. So we say for this child, and you have to know it's on your Oh My God packet, give them uh, medication holidays. In other words, all summer long, don't put them on the shit. Let them do their themselves. Weekends, don't make them take it. Okay? So again, medication holidays. Do not put them on this crap all summer long when they're not needing to be a certain way in school. Okay. Uh, last but not least, the last page and we're out. Remember, don't put domestic violence, put partner violence. Child abuse is exactly what it looks like on this page, except I'm going to add bedwetting. Remember, bed wedding after five is child abuse until proven it's not. What kind of abuse? Generally sexual. Frequent UTIs, child abuse until proven it's not. So bed wedding, frequent UTIs, bruises and all kind of different freaking colors. I had the one girl had got beat up so much. She literally had blue, purple, red, and yellow bruises on her body. Okay, so that was, I took her in that room and photographed every single one of them and went to court with her. So, you know, it may be an adult, right? So this is a child. Okay, so this child has weird shit going on with ligature marks burns that are immersion burns highlighted all this stuff is on there so immersion burns is on the right hand side ligature marks is called rope burns uh human bites put cigarette burns i don't know if it says that already cigarette burns the top uh, they just stick the cigarette in the kid almost like they're putting it out nothing hurts this child your little Piece of shit, shots and injections and IVs ain't nothing compared to what they deal with. So they don't even cry with IVs, which is a little weird. 
Okay, so nothing you do hurt them. They don't look you in the eye because they believe, probably rightly so, um, based on their history, they believe that if they look you in the face, you may hit them. Because what happens with these kids is they look at their mother in the corner and think, who the fuck are you looking at? You know, and they get punched and all this stuff. That's real. I've seen that. I've had that happen to me, so I remember. Now, so you don't, they don't look you in the face, okay? And they're very protective of their mother or father. And before you get it twisted in a weird, sick way, this child still loves their mother or their father, whoever's abusing them or both. They still love them to the core. They don't have anything else or anybody else to love. And that is their world. So when you take them away, right, not you personally, but when they are taken away, it's totally crushing. That's all they know. That's what you got to remember. Uh, now, we have a legal responsibility to report it, and you know that. We take photographs. We get this child alone and, in, and uh, in, in, um, uh, interview them. So I was explaining how bedwetting after five is not cool. Not, not not cool, but it should be investigated for child abuse. One of the young ladies in my class, her child was seven, all of a sudden he started peeing on himself. They had moved in with her mom so that they could save money, she could study and get out. And so they had moved in with mom, she had a 15 year old, old uh, younger brother, and he was raping her son. And if it wasn't for that conversation, she would have never known. So she went home, I explained to her that she needs to have her son talk to his dad, because she said he's closer to his dad. And his dad needs to say to him, I love you no matter what, but I'm worried about you, and I need to know if anybody bothering me. And that's when he started crying and saying he was wetting the bed because all the rapes happened in the bathroom when everybody else was sleeping. So if he just stayed in the bed and he had to go pee, just pee in the bed. Mm -hmm. so he didn't want to go to the bathroom. He was literally being raped. Okay, so bedwetting is a big deal. All right, now, the, uh, the partner violence, signs and symptoms. So let's remind ourselves this is a control issue and it's all about power. Put in big capital letters, because you've still got patients that won't believe it, but put in big capital letters, there is absolutely nothing a woman can do that deserves to be hit. There is nothing she can do that deserves to be hit. What did we say the other day? Walk, walk away. away. Nobody's got a gun in your fucking head. Get up and walk away. Stop staying in toxic shit. That's for the guy, right? Don't hit a woman, right? You learn that when you learn Don't hit women when you learn that. You should be teaching your sons that as well. Now, so, with this lady, right? What is she doing? She's putting up with something she doesn't understand. So she's very flattered. You had to know that at first. She's flattered that he wants to know where was she. She's flattered that, she, that he wants to know, uh, wants her back home right away. He's flat, she's flattered that he's so attentive. Usually this flattered woman does not know the love of a man because she had no father to show her. The first love you know comes from a man is your father. Mm -hmm. If he shows you how it's supposed to look, then you won't tolerate anything less. And if you do, it will be temporary. So you gotta remember he's gonna tell her what to wear. He's gonna check her phone, he's gonna look at her computer, he's gonna check her search history, he's going to um, time her when she goes anywhere. He's going to demand that she doesn't even make eye contact with male figures. He's going to pick a fight when he thinks that she's paying attention to something or someone else more. He will absolutely not like her if she goes to nursing school and tries to better herself. That's when my patient was pushed down the stairs with her book bag on top. Actually, she was kicked down the stairs. She comes in here and talks every now and then, usually in October. Um, they do not want you to become independent. The dependency role is flattering, so they may keep you pregnant and forbid you birth control. It is not uncommon for this person to have one in the belly and two babies in tow. Here's the hard part. There's something called the cycle of violence. It is a triangle more than a circle. The triangle starts with the Hostility building, 
were just yelling, cursing, screaming, name calling. Keep this in mind. If they'll call you a name, then they will throw things. If they will throw things, they will push you. If they will push you, they will punch you. If they will punch you, they will kill you. It's a cycle. It just gets worse. So in the hostility building phase, they're doing their name calling. They're doing their screaming. They're doing the throwing. Um, they're, uh, you know, complaining about dinner. They're yelling about your school. They're telling you you've got to quit this and fuck that and all this. Just crazy. Just crazy, chaotic, crazy. Uh, usually this is uh, during the time when you, if you're the lady in the situation or the man, you're trying to get everything to please them. You're trying to keep the kids quiet. You're trying to do whatever they say and predict what he'll yell about. You're trying to run around and cross the T's and dot the I's. You are very fearful and you just don't want things to escalate. You may even tell the kids just stay at your mom, at your grandma, you know, your mother's. You just don't even want them to come home because you already know what's coming. Now, then the next one is battery. Battery also includes rape. The battery can take two hours to two straight days, stopping and starting. If you've seen any of the popular movies, you already know that. So sleeping with the enemy, burning bed, uh, enough. Um, there's so many, oh my God. But burning bed, I thought by far was the most um, compelling in terms of what usually happens. Uh, in terms of the family supporting this abuse. I had a young lady in my class, she had a GI bleed. Why did she have a GI bleed? Because she kept taking Motrin. Why did she keep taking Motrin? Because she had bad headaches. Why did she have bad headaches? Because she had had a concussion. Why did she have a concussion? Because he bashed her head in at least twice during the time she was in my class. So GI bleed, NSAIDs, concussion, bashed head. Wow. And her mother said, he's a good man. Try to help, try to be patient. That's what her mother said. <laughs> So you saw that in What's Love Got to Do With It in Tina Turner, okay? So family can make you stay, truly, especially you know you can't go there, all right? Now, this battery phase, the reason why rape is included is because that represents power. And so once they're done beating the crap out of you and then they're inebriated or sober, then they want to make up, okay? But you don't, of course. Something about black eyes and cracked ribs that don't make you in the mood. Now, the last part, the last part of your triangle is going to be the honeymoon phase, right? By the way, during this honeymoon phase is immense apologies, tearful begging, swears that they'll never do it again, and here's the worst part. They're really, truly mean it. They don't want to ever do this again to you. They really are sorry. They honestly and truly wish they could stop. They don't want to do this to you. I know it's hard for any of you who've been through it to believe that, but I swear to God, we know this if we don't know anything else in the psychology of this situation. Here's what we know. The success rate for someone who beats up on women or men, the success rate of stopping them is no better than pedophilia cure. If they did it once, they'll do it again. We have the same success rate as we do with pedophiles, which is damn near zero. If they do it once, they'll do it again. Same success rate as curing a pedophile. That's profound. Okay? So you've got to remember that at the very beginning, when the flattery is really taking off because somebody cares about me because daddy didn't or whatever, this is going to get really bad for most people. Okay? Your job is not to tell her to leave. Don't ever do that because it's when she leaves that she gets murdered. I have quite a few friends and family that are dead, so do not tell her to leave. Have her make a safety plan. Have her make an extra set of keys. 
have her get her social security number, birth certificate, and get a copy of all of that for the children as well. Have her keep it somewhere other than mom's house because that's where he's going to go first. So I used to keep stuff here for some of my, my babies. Remember that a sign of domestic violence is frequent absenteeism from work or school because you don't want your, you know, your retinal detachment and black eye to show. Okay, so just keep safety plan. Keep talking about a safety plan. Get her to remember the number here locally because I will never forget it because I used it at 17. It's 216-391-HELP. 216-391-HELP. There is a hotline nationally. I just remember that one. It's forever ingrained in my brain. 216-391-HELP. Say it to her in the bathroom. Get her to tell you stuff in the bathroom. When I interview these patients, I have to get them away from the offender. I take them to the bathroom like I'm trying to show them a special urine test for the baby. Because they're usually pregnant, right? So I take them in the bathroom, and that's where I do a lot of stuff really, really fast. Like tell them the number, explain to them that I'm worried about them. I don't want them to leave unless they feel it's safe, but this is a phone number that they can use if they ever need to. And then I just ask them do they want me to contact anybody or what do they want me to do. If there are children in the home and the police are called, it will be an automatic charge for her and him called child endangerment. So she'll catch a case behind his nonsense. Child endangering, you had to know that. If the cops get called, it's going to be child endangering as long as there are children in the home and they will both catch that charge. Now she's got a case and she's trying to be a nurse hint. hint. Have a good night.